Hello and welcome to The Conversation Weekly. This week, the untold story of a Dutch double agent, abandoned after 22 years of service. It's 1968, and a man we're calling M is doing an internship in Israel. He's studying engineering in the Netherlands, where he's from, and the internship is part of his course. One day, he gets a slightly unusual dinner invitation. He was approached by a German uh, man who was a bit older than he was, by the name of uh, Gerber. And uh, he was very interested in M, in what he was studying, what what his interests were, what his uh, political leanings were, and so on. This is Ben de Jong. He's a research fellow in intelligence at Leiden University in the Netherlands and an expert on spying during the Cold War. And in hindsight, I think it's fairly clear that this man Gerber, who was in fact, as it would turn out later, an East German Stasi intelligence officer, was a talent spotter. He spotted M as a possible target for recruitment. During the internship, Gerber meets with M on several occasions. But then M returns to the Netherlands and they lose touch. Soon after, M gets a good job with a Dutch multinational that often takes him abroad. One day, when he's visiting a town in West Germany, a stranger comes up to him on the street. A German who passed him greetings from Herr Gerber and invited him to a meeting in East Berlin. M is being recruited to be a spy for the Stasi. But what this German friend of Gerber doesn't know is that M is already a spy for the Dutch Secret Service. And straight away, he tells his Dutch handlers about the Stasi recruitment attempt. They told him, well, you accept this offer, you have your meeting in East Berlin. And that was the beginning of his career as a double agent. M has been talking to Ben and his colleague Eleni Bratt, who's an associate professor of international history at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Ben and Eleni are used to hearing the stories of double agents and spies looking back on their lives of intrigue and high adrenaline. But M's story stood out. As well as working for the Dutch, he'd also been a spy for the CIA. And so he knew about the innermost workings of three secret services during the heart of the Cold War. M wants to remain anonymous, but he also wants to share his story. He wants to make clear that it was an important work that he did ideologically on the side of the West during the Cold War. But at the same time, he also felt that he had been treated uh, rather badly by two of the services that he worked for, namely the Dutch Security Service and the CIA. And he wanted to share that experience too, uh, also as a way to work through this side of his spying career the way he was treated uh, psychologically, so to speak. I'm Gemma Ware, and you're listening to The Conversation Weekly, The World Explained by Experts. In this episode, the Cold War double agent who feels abandoned by the spy agencies he risked his life for. Eleni and Ben first met M in 2018. They were at a conference at Leiden University, where intelligence historians and former members of the security services meet to talk about their work and swap stories about the Cold War. They'd heard M introduce himself to the conference earlier in the day as a double agent, and they were eager to find out more. So they went up to him in the bar afterwards. The most interesting part of these meetings are the drinks afterwards. So that's where we met M in a bar. Despite this very noisy environment in the bar, he managed to convey to us a very deep-rooted interest, actually even an obsession, in his own past, first of all, but also in everything connected to intelligence. Eleni and Ben knew they wanted to talk to M more. We agreed to meet at his home another time, so where it would be more quiet. And it was the first of uh, now... Uh, seven interviews we had with him. They just published an article in the International Journal of Intelligence and Counterintelligence based on these conversations and their subsequent research into M's life. And they've written about it for the conversation too. Who is M? Tell us a bit about him. Yeah, M was born in the Netherlands into a family of a working class background. Part of his secondary school was in the United States for a year or so. He was trained as an engineer, and there was also something that served him greatly in his spying career later. And something else that is important to mention is that he was interested in politics from a very young age. 
from the point of view of his personality, let's say, he is generally quite relaxed when you talk to him. But if you pay a little bit of attention, you can see that he's very aware of the people he talks to, how they respond to what he, he tells them, how they uh, look at him. He pays a lot of attention to his environment. As a young man living in the Netherlands, M was required to do military service. And his first contact uh, with intelligence tradecraft was during his military service. So would he have been about 18 or something like that? Yeah, yeah. This was during the mid-1960s, and it led to his first contact with the Dutch security service, who gave him training in counterintelligence and security. It was after his studies and his military service that he got a job at a Dutch multinational. And uh, for this multinational, he was stationed, well, uh, basically all over the place in different continents, uh, in Africa, the Middle East, East Asia. And he stayed there for a very long period. And he is a very good networker. So he established many international contacts. And this way, he was also able to acquire information which had intelligence value. This is when the Dutch Secret Service moved to recruit him as a spy. They apparently saw him as a promising candidate for recruitment because of all the international contacts that would come from this job. And, and why did he decide to, to say yes? From what he told us, it is clear that he enjoyed the adventurous aspect of the work as a spy. Uh, but he was also uh, ideologically uh, committed to the West. And it gave him satisfaction to see himself as a cold warrior in the fight against communism which was still, of course, a very alive issue uh, in those days. OK. What kind of things were the Dutch intelligence agency asking him to do in those initial years? Well, the Dutch service was very interested in having him infiltrate uh, on their behalf in, in uh, local anti-communist organisations. So not only anti-communist, but even fascist and radical right-wing organisations in the Netherlands that were also part of international networks. And one such organisation was uh, Jeune Europe, or Young Europe. Uh, Jeune Europe had a branch in the Netherlands and M managed to contact the people from this branch rather easily. Because as I said earlier, yeah, he's a, he's a very sociable, very talented person. So that was uh, undoubtedly also a reason why the Dutch service was interested in having him as an agent, that he's very able to gain people's trust. And what did he tell you about his handlers from the Dutch Secret Service? His handlers from the Dutch Service, they were much older than he was. They were a generation older. They were also, generally speaking, fairly religious people. And several of them uh, had experienced the war and the, the German occupation of, of uh, the Netherlands and had even been involved in resistance activities. And we've actually got a few quotes from the interviews that you did with M that we're going to hear throughout this episode. This first one is about M's relationship with his Dutch handlers, and it's been voiced up by Mend Marwani, my co-producer. They weren't great intellectuals. Some of them were civil servants who had come from the Dutch East Indies, people with a somewhat bureaucratic mindset. They were above 50, and I was in my mid-twenties, so our relationship resembled one between father and son. I got assignments, and I reported back to them. Everything was very businesslike. I think the important thing is that he never felt really close to them because they treated him very formally. They addressed him formally and they kept themselves uh, at a distance. Uh, and this came on top of the generational uh, difference. Yet it was these handlers who M went to when the Stasi reached out to recruit him. The Dutch told him to go to East Berlin and agree to spy on behalf of the Stasi. So he did. And he chose a code name, Janssen, which is a common surname in the Netherlands, like Smith in English. And his operational work for the Dutch service largely coincided with his work for the Stasi. So it, it was to infiltrate in these local anti-communist, fascist or radical right-wing organizations in the Netherlands. But the Stasi was also interested in anti-communist organizations and Russian emigre groups. In Western Europe, a very well-known one is the NTS, an organization that was based in Frankfurt am Main. What they also asked him to do was to get in touch with individuals that lived in the Netherlands, but that regularly traveled to Eastern Europe or the Soviet Union, because obviously these individuals could possibly be approached as possible agents, as possible targets. They wanted to know about the Dutch gas project and the physicists behind it. They were very interested in the Urenco Ultra Centrifuge project in Almelo. It's in one of the eastern provinces of the Netherlands. This was clearly also something 
that was of interest for the Soviets and, and, and not so much for the East Germans. So a very clear indication that the East German service was working very closely with the KGB. And what they made him do was, for example, approach and talk to specialists that were involved in this ultra centrifuge project. So was he giving the Stasi false information or was he just giving them enough to make them keep wanting to, to work with him? How was it working no. in that way? No, it wasn't false information. The information was uh, true, as far as we know, but he always agreed with his Dutch handlers. It was a good thing to, to give this information to the Stasi. So he never gave the information independently. So the, the trick was that the information should be convincing enough for the Stasi to think that this was really valuable information. But of course, it shouldn't be information that would harm or that would damage Dutch interests. Interesting. And how did he give them the information? Were there any spying techniques that he told you about? He had dozens of meetings, literally, uh, with his East German handlers behind the Iron Curtain. And because the thing is, he was stationed for this multinational company in faraway places, let's say in East Asia. But he would be on leave in the Netherlands to visit family and so on for extended periods. And during his leave, he would uh, travel off to East Berlin uh, or other locations behind the Iron Curtain, but very often in the GDR. That's where he had his um, personal meetings with these uh, two handlers. He also sometimes, when it suited his work schedule, he handed over material at East German embassies abroad when he had a good excuse through his work to go there. Or sometimes he also had brush passes, let's say in the lobby of hotels. Brush passes are fleeting, very brief meetings where material is being exchanged. And so he would hand off material, written material to the person he would meet with, with a special password, of course, so that they would recognize each other. And uh, he would uh, receive instructions uh, from this person, all in a very short uh, moment. So real spying kind of, yes, you know, <laughs> yeah, activities. Yeah, v very exciting. Tell us a bit about his Stasi handlers and the relationship that he had with them. Yes, uh, this Mr. Gerber, whom he met in in Israel during his internship there, fairly uh, soon moved out of the picture, and he became acquainted with his two Stasi handlers that he would have uh, meetings with quite a few, in fact, over a period of almost about uh, twenty years. And um, these were Wolfgang Koch and Heinz Metzelmann. Their names can be found in uh, publications about uh, the Stasi, also in uh, some of the German archive material that has been released by uh, the German uh, authorities from the uh, former archive of the uh, Stasi. And what was the relationship like with them? They were almost like friends, which was in a way, of course, a very paradoxical situation, because even though the atmospherics were generally very good, uh, at the same time, he, he was betraying them, right? So this was a, a almost a schizophrenic situation. And the way these two Stasi officers behaved towards him also had a good cop, bad cop. And so one of them, Wolfgang Koch, was a more, let's say, a stricter person. And when harsh things had to be said, then he would do that. Uh, the other guy, Nutzelman, was uh, much more amicable, much more easygoing than Koch, for instance. They were also totally different from his uh, Dutch handlers. Because the Dutch handlers, not only were they much more formal, but they were also stingy with uh, money and giving presents. And told us uh, several times, they never gave me a present. Maybe once or twice a bottle of wine, but that was it. When he's discussing this, he still gets very agitated and angry about this. We'll hear another quote now from M where he's talking about his Stasi handlers and he compares them to the Dutch. Um, just a note here, he refers to them by the acronym BVD, which was the name of the secret service in the Netherlands at the time. I had once bought a very nice book of fairy tales for myself in Denmark and sometime later they gave me a similar book as a present. I received medals from them, whereas the BVD never gave me a medal or another sign of recognition, not even a ballpoint. At another meeting with Wolfgang and Heinz in the East, I received all kinds of special treats because I'd gotten married six months earlier, in 1970. So we're in the 1970s now. What information was M handing back to the Dutch about his Stasi handlers? 
he would tell his Dutch handlers uh, basically everything he got to know about his East German handlers, about their personalities, because that's what every intelligence or security service always wants to know about the personnel and the characters of the personnel of the opposing service. That's very important. The Dutch uh, service also wanted to know specifically what the intelligence targets of the East Germans were with an eye on enhancing security, let's say, important industrial targets uh, that, that the East Germans were after. They would want to know everything about the modus operandi, as they call it in the intelligence world, it is the working methods of the East Germans. What kind of codes did they use? Where were the safe houses in East Berlin, even where M had his meetings with his handlers? How did he receive instructions when he was stationed abroad and, and when he was not having uh, personal meetings? Um, what kind of message did he receive through the uh, shortwave uh, radio broadcast that he would then uh, listen to? What time uh, would these broadcasts be? Even very minor details were of interest. Okay, so lots of operational information. Yes. So we got to this point where he's playing this double agent role and then the situation changed a bit. Can you tell us what happened next? Yeah, for his work for the multinational, he moved Outside of the Netherlands, he went to all parts of the world. And that's where he actually was outside of the remit of the Dutch service because the Dutch security service was legally allowed only to operate within the Netherlands. So that's when they handed him over to the CIA. It was in 1981 uh, because the CIA was, of course, practically everywhere in the world. So it was much more practical for him to become their double agent. So the transfer took place in, in Rotterdam over a dinner in a restaurant and there were a couple of some of his handlers from the Dutch service and uh, three representatives from the CIA and uh, during this meeting the Dutch service officially distanced themselves uh, from M and they made him sign a special agreement in this regard. Saying that he would now be a CIA agent. Yeah and that they were, would have no responsibility whatsoever over him or his well-being anymore. And how did he feel about that? The thing is that he told us that there were so many things happening during this meeting and he had to sign all kinds of stuff. So he didn't really pay attention to this this one agreement that he had to sign where they renounced all responsibility for him. In 2016, the Dutch Secret Service eventually gave M access to the file that they'd been holding on him. In it, he found the agreement he'd signed at that meeting when he was handed over to the CIA. Yeah, it made him feel quite awkward. He had uh, worked for all these years for the Dutch service, and now they they were distancing themselves completely from him. And what did the CIA want him to do for them that was different from what his Dutch handlers had been asking him? Yeah, what the CIA specifically wanted him to do at some point is to make a very elaborate psychological analysis on the basis of a test score that the CIA had put together about the character traits of his Stasi handlers. The idea behind this program which in the CIA was called Racketeer, that was the code name of the program, that envisaged uh, the possible recruitment of agent handlers from the opposing services. Uh, but it, uh, in the case of M, this program really, uh, as far as we know and as far as M knows, uh, never got off the ground really because this was by the end of his spying career. And also if a recruitment attempt of either Koch or Nutzelman, his two Stasi handlers, had taken place, then it would definitely not have been M who had done the recruiting, but someone else. What were his CIA handlers like and and did he trust them and trust what they were asking him to do? Yeah, he trusted them, but there wasn't that much of a bond between them. He had many CIA handlers because he moved in all those uh, parts of the world. Uh, Every time he used to meet different people, he had one first CIA handler that remained as a kind of mentor to him. So he would be in touch with him a bit more often than he did with his other CIA handlers. So the, the, the result was that he met so many of them that there was less of a bond between them than he had with his uh, East German handlers who stayed the same during the whole period of time. By the mid-1980s, M had been a double agent for about a decade carefully keeping up his relationship with his two Stasi handlers, while all the while feeding information about them back to the Dutch and then the CIA. But he was very nervous that the Stasi would discover that he was a double agent. In fact, this fear of being found out by the East Germans was always present. 
that's what he uh, made clear to us when he's uh, talking about the meetings he had. During these meetings behind the Iron Curtain, he took, in fact, a considerable personal risk because if he would have found out as a double agent, the consequences would have been severe for him personally. He would have ended up uh, probably uh, in prison for a considerable time. So he was always very tense. He always had to be on guard that he wouldn't betray himself in his contact with the East Germans, even when he was having a nice drink of French cognac in a pub with them. He had to be careful basically about every gesture, every nuance in the way he would uh, speak about his experiences in the West, let's say. And did the Stasi ever suspect him? That's the question that's been an obsession to him, actually, for ever since. There was an, quite a traumatic experience in 1985. He was in East Berlin for a debriefing session. It usually took a couple of days and he was staying in a, in a safe house. It was an apartment uh, from uh, the East German service. And at four o'clock in the morning, he was lifted off his bed by a couple of burly fellows who, who told him that he was arrested. And he took him in his pajamas to a van. He couldn't see where he was going, but uh, he, he went to the Hohenschönhauser prison, a very notorious prison in East Berlin. And that's where he was being kept for a day. It was early spring and pretty cold. Their behaviour was rough, to say the least. After they've taken you in, they examine you. You're ordered to undress completely. All body openings are being inspected rather roughly. They threw me in a prison cell, and after a while they took me out again. Naked, through the corridors on my way to the interrogation room. The corridors were lit, and if somebody would arrive from the opposite direction, they'd push your face against the wall. It was overwhelming, to put it mildly. What did he tell you about how he felt during this mock arrest? He was very scared, but he was actually quite confident that they didn't really know that he was a traitor because the, the questions that they asked him, or they weren't specific enough. And they just kept on shouting to him, you're a traitor, etc. But they didn't say what they suspected him precisely. Uh, because it remained so vague, he was quite confident uh, that they weren't onto him, really. And actually... He had the courage to even tell them, how could you do this to me? I've been working for all these years for you, um, putting myself at great risk, and now you're doing this to me. How, how do you dare, etc.? So he went into the offensive. How did it end then? Yeah, there was a, a very strange turn of event, the way it ended. You have to keep in mind that he was being kept for hours in this interrogation room. He was naked, sitting on a chair, and he had been chained to the chair, right? And then all of a sudden... His Stasi handlers, Wolfgang and Heinz, as he knew them, walked into the room and they congratulated him and uh, said to him, congratulations, you are now one of us. You're also a real socialist and we are eager uh, to go on working with you and so on. And then he was allowed uh, to uh, put on his clothing again and he was taken to a safe house together with his two East German handlers. And there was another sudden turn of events because he had a meeting with the legendary spice chief of the East Germans, a man by the name of Markus Wolf, who uh, presented him uh, with an award for his services for the Stasi. And yeah, so it can only be uh, described as a fairly bizarre turn of events. And did he ever find out why this happened? That's, of course, a question which uh, keeps him busy till this very day. It could have been that there really was a kind of suspicion against him on the part of the East Germans that maybe he was a double agent or a traitor in some other way. But it could also be that maybe this was just a way to, to test his mettle, to see if he would stand up under psychological pressure, how he would deal with uh, situations like that. So there are those two possibilities and he's still asking himself what was going on there? What, what, why did I have to go through this experience? Why did the East Germans uh, who professed to be his best friends, so to speak, prior to this experience, why did they do this to me? And he doesn't manage to come up with a satisfying answer. The answer is, let's say, in the, the archives of the intelligence service of the Stasi, which to a large uh, extent have been destroyed. So 1985, this happens. Tell us what happened after that. 
after the 1985 incident, uh, the democ arrest, as we uh, call it, um, for a couple of years, the uh, relationship between M and his East German handlers was quite okay. And they went back to their old ways, so to speak. But then all of a sudden, there was a similar incident in which relations cooled a couple of years later in 1988. When quite suddenly, again, their uh, attitude towards him became very different, much less friendly, especially on the part of uh, Koch. In M's debriefings to the CIA describing his Stasi handlers and their attributes, he often stressed that Koch had brown eyes. And at some point during uh, this particular meeting in uh, 88, Koch even said to him, you don't like brown eyes, do you? And he even said this to M in English, which was highly unusual because they would usually speak German to each other. And uh, the phrase, I don't like brown eyes, that's uh, the phrase that M had told his CIA handlers during one of his debriefings about his contacts with the East Germans, almost literally. So this was a very unnerving experience for M, and he had to keep up a facade of remaining calm because this suggested to him that Koch knew about the content of his debriefings by the CIA. Thereafter, the contact between M and his East German handlers remained much cooler till the end of the whole operation, which came, of course, with the collapse of the GDR and, and the end of the Stasi. So he suspected that he'd been betrayed in some way? Yes, he has been, you could say, obsessing about this ever since. Have I been betrayed? Uh, if I have been betrayed, which is likely in his view, uh, by whom was I betrayed? And he thinks it's most likely that he was betrayed from inside the CIA. And we've got a quote here about how he felt after this 1988 incident. I could no longer trust anyone. I had to be constantly alert and wary. To remain in this position over such a long period of time requires much stamina. There is a line of appreciation, trust, but also of abandonment. You're being used as a pawn by something amorphous, by an entity that you cannot enter. No, they will approach you. You are appreciated for your efforts. But these services remain a dark cloud that you cannot enter. How did it all end? It ended quite abruptly. He got a telegram in 1990 from his East German handlers where they cancelled a meeting that they were supposed to have in Budapest. And the telegram was very short. It said, proposed meeting to be omitted. About new date, you will be informed. Signed, Gerber. That was it. Actually, he was never informed about a new date. And all these uh, years that he's working with his East German handlers or actually, of course, betraying them, it, it ended like this, very abruptly. These were the end days of the Cold War. The Berlin Wall had fallen the previous year in 1989, and then in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. As M's relationship with the Stasi ended, the CIA also lost interest in him. The relationship he had with the CIA also ended rather abruptly in the sense that the CIA never inquired afterwards about how he was doing, whether he was doing financially okay. There was no aftercare he received and he still feels very bad about it. Only after many years he managed to track down his first handler from the CIA and uh, they even visited each other, which is very uncommon also. And it was very important to him to be finally able to talk to him about his operational past and especially about the, the possible betrayal from within the CIA. And this contact that he developed with his first CIA handler compensated for the lack of interest from the CIA as an organization. So M was a double agent for 30 years. He worked for three secret services. And he's told you this amazing story in, over these hours of interviews that you've done with him. How did you go about verifying that all of this was true? Yeah, that's, of course, a very important question. And the thing is, in uh, many intelligence history stories, it's not uh, possible uh, to verify everything. And because archives are not accessible, or in, in the case of the East Germans, large chunks of it have been destroyed. But of course, we still try to verify as much as possible from his story. And one of the things we did is we consulted the existing intelligence history literature on comparable double agent cases. And then you see certain uh, similarities. Also, 
There are a few documents that survive from the Stasi archives that M lays hands on, that he received from the German organization that supervises the archives, where his code name is mentioned, uh, his code name Janssen. There is correspondence between M and uh, the Dutch service. This dates from the 2010s, when he was trying to get access to his file with the Dutch service. M tried to access his file twice. It was quite a long process, but finally he, he managed to get access to his file. He, he was allowed to go to the Dutch Intelligence and Security Service a couple of years ago, in 2016. And there he was allowed to see his file, but he wasn't allowed to, to take any notes or copy anything. And we tried, of course, also to incorporate the view of the Dutch security service in our research. So we uh, asked for access to M's file too, but we, we were denied access uh, several times. One aspect about the uh, CIA side of things is that, of course, M is in touch with one of his former CIA handlers and uh, it has even developed a friendly relationship with him. And we have also seen some of the email correspondence between M and his former handler, which makes clear that there was a link between M and the CIA. What has life been like for M since 1990, since his spying career ended? The period after his uh, spying career ended was on many levels uh, fairly difficult for him because he suffered from the feeling that he had been abandoned by uh, specifically the two services that he was really loyal to, namely the Dutch service and the CIA. You're left entirely to your own devices. The separation from my handlers was really a turning point. Until then, I was engaged in all kinds of geopolitical developments. I was right on top of them. I had interesting contacts. And then suddenly, all this ended and I was sitting at home. That was a shock. Did he feel he'd been particularly badly treated? Yes, also uh, because the CIA broke off contact with him also abruptly. And in the case of the Dutch service in the 2010s, he was briefly hospitalized uh, for psychological problems. And he approached the Dutch service and asked them, can you help me? Can you refer me to some institution that that could help me with my specific problems that have to do with uh, my past as a double agent who has worked for you? They basically said to him, well, I'm sorry, um, we can't help you. You better go and see your uh, GP. And he was extremely angry about that. Also, when he told us about it on several occasions, he got very agitated. And and how is he doing now? Do you feel like the conversations you've had with him have, have helped in some way to process what's happened to him? Yeah, we think that's the case. And he also told us that it has helped him a great deal. It also has helped him to open up more to his wife about these specific episodes that were quite violent or traumatizing to him, even to other family members to open up a bit more. After he got this rejection by the Dutch service to go and see his GP, eventually he managed to get in touch with an organization that helps out war veterans. And that's where he receives treatment, up until this day even. The lack of aftercare, in this particular instance at least, is a striking element of the story. And that's also one of the reasons why basically he he approached us and wanted to tell his story, his bitterness about the way he has been treated. And we, of course, would very much have liked to hear the story the service has to tell about this, but they didn't want to talk to us, unfortunately. But as historians, you would like to know the story from the other side as well. Well, hopefully one day you do get access. We hope so too. Thank you so much, both of you, for spending the time to tell us uh, about your research. It's been fascinating hearing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Bender Young and Eleni Bratt for their time talking to us for this episode. You can read an article that they've written about M on The Conversation. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Thanks too to Paul Keevley and Mike Hurd from The Conversation's Insights team who edited Ben and Eleni's article for The Conversation. Final thanks go to our global executive editor, Stephen Kahn, to Alice Mason for our social media and to Soraya Nandi for help with our transcripts. You can find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, on Instagram at theconversation.com or email us on podcast at theconversation.com. Do also sign up for our free daily email by clicking the link in the show notes. And if you like what we do, please support our podcast and The Conversation by going to donate.theconversation.com. 
The Conversation Weekly is co-produced by Menda Marawani and me, Gemma Ware, with sound design by Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Sal. Thanks for listening. Listening.